Um, and I had a, a blessed time um, the sharing the book of Romans with Mongolia public school teachers who are gathered under the ministry of Mongolia Campus Crusade for Christ uh, Teachers Ministry. And um, as usual, uh, although I went to Mongolia as a Bible teacher, I learned and I gained more. And I was greatly challenged by Mongolian teachers' passion for Jesus. And I also was challenged by this small countryside church. Um, and in this countryside church, uh, they're, they're using an overhead projector. Do you guys know overhead projector? Yeah, it's, we used to use this like, like 20 years ago, right? And they're still using overhead projector. And because they did not have a like praise team or praise equipment, they were just following the songs from CDs. And there were only about 20 people, including small kids, in tiny room. And but their worship was so sincere and so passionate. And I could not help but to think about our worship in America, where the churches are equipped with the most high techs from computers to sound to ACs. Uh, we're so used to worship um, conveniently and comfortably that we sometimes lose our focus very easily if the technical difficulty or, or errors happen. The worship in that small church made me really examine my heart of worship. Please don't, under, please don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying that the worship that is offered with low tags and in very uncomfortable ways are, are better worship. That's not what I'm saying. But what I'm saying and what I want to say is that we tend to focus on how I feel about worship than if I had worshipped God in a way that He wants me to worship. In that sense, as part two of the sermon that continues from two weeks ago, develop, developing a deeper relationship with God is very important because that determines the way we worship our God and because that determines the way we will live each day for God's glory. So let's continue on with developing a friendship with God. So let's go, come back to the book of James, chapter 4, verse 8. And it says that the... Uh, the, way to, uh, the way to develop fresh with God is by drawing near to God. James 4.8 says, draw near to God and He will draw near to you. Draw near to God. Now, draw near to God means returning to God in covenant renewal after strain. Returning to God in covenant renewal after strain. So simply it means returning to God with repentance. Returning to God with repentance. Let's read of Malachi chapter 3 verse 7. Malachi 3 7 says, From the days of your fathers, you have turned aside from my statutes and have not kept them. Return to me, and I'll return to you, says the Lord of hosts. But you say, how shall we return? Now think about the life of King David. David, King David committed adultery. He murdered. He lied. And later, this prophet named Nathan convicted him of his sin. As a powerful king, David could, King David could have killed Nathan for revealing his sin. Or David could have denied his sin. But that's what most powerful people to do this day, right? They deny until they realize that there is no way out. And that's what we do many times. You know, my daughters do that all the time. Especially my youngest one. You know, she ate chocolate and she denies. Until I bring her to a mirror and show her face. But what did David do? When, he was, when his sin was revealed by the prophet, David repented. That means David drew near to God. David repented and he came back 
to God. And one of the most famous psalms written by David is Psalm 51. And this is the psalm that David wrote after he realized that he sinned against God. So let me share with you some portion of Psalm 51, verse 10 to 13. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and, up, and uphold me with the willing spirit, that I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will return to you. But draw near to God means more than repentance. We draw near to God to worship Him, to serve Him, to meet God, to seek His help, and to gain assurance, as well as to repent. And I want to ask you, is this what you are doing these days? That you draw near to God. That you come back to God. Whenever you are convicted of your sins, do you come back to God in repentance? When was the last time? When was the last time that you drew to God with all your heart, with the contrite spirit about your sin? We're so used to repent very lightly that we go and fall back to sin. And we call so-called repent. But we fall back again. And we repent again and again and again. And we tend to think our repentance are just saying sorry to God. And everything is all taken care of. That's why we take sins very lightly. And that's why we fall back again and again and again. In our repentance, there is no heartbreaking tears. Isn't it true? In our repentance these days, there is no heart-wrenching cry. I'm not saying we are to get emotional, but we need to know that because of our sins, that God's Son, Jesus Christ, had to come and shed His blood on the cross to wash our sins and save us. We are to take our sins very seriously. We are to draw to God. That's one of the ways to get closer. That's the one of the ways to develop our friendship with God. And how else can we develop friendship with God? Let's continue on with chapter 4, verse 8. It says, draw near to God, and He will draw near to you. And it says, cleanse your hands, you sinners. We are to cleanse our hands. This phrase, cleanse your hands, speaks of the outward cleansing. The outward of the instrument of sin, referred to as our hands. The command to wash hands means to purify our actions and change our external behavior. Cleanse your hand means change our external behavior. Why? Because the way we live matters to God. The way you live matters to God. Last one month, think about this month of June or May. What external behavior did you change after you realized that you were doing what was not right in God's eyes? Can you think of any one thing that you changed because you were convicted that what you were doing was not right in God's eyes. Or have you ever changed your external behavior after you were convicted and convinced that it was not glorifying God? Just try to think about one or two. When was the last time that you were really convicted and, and you did your best to try to change your external behavior? I'm not asking you to change your external behavior. But we need to really examine our inner heart. And if we're being transformed inside out.
by the gospel of Jesus Christ. Another way to develop friendship with God is by purifying our hearts. Verse 4, 8. Draw near to God and He will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. The heart represents motives or intentions. So when the Bible says purify your heart, that means you are to look within your heart. You gotta examine your intention. You gotta you gotta examine your, your motive. And you have to ask the gospel. You have to ask God. You have to ask the Holy Spirit to completely change your heart. And he says, you double-minded. Double-minded has the same connotation as in James chapter 1, verse 6 to 8. Can we look at James chapter 1, verse 6 to 8? He says, but let him ask in faith, with no doubting. For the one who has doubt is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man unstable in all his ways. That means they were two-souled, divided between their commitment to God and yet wanting to be friends with the world. Also, this is the person who lacks integrity, who claims one thing and lives another. We call ourselves Christian. We say, we love God with all my heart, but at the same time, we are loving the world. That's double-minded. But why are there so many double-minded Christians? I think it's because they feel God is not reliable. That's the bottom line. Although we say we trust in God, although we say we believe in God, so many times we find ourselves not finding God reliable. We find money, power, more reliable than our God. That's why we are double-minded. No matter what you say, if your life reveals double-minded, then that's who we really are. And that's what James is speaking to us about. It's not just about what you claim, but it's about your life that truly reveals your heart. I cannot judge, but sometimes I really wonder if some people are really Christians. Because they are really double-minded, not being able to rely on God completely. You know, we are to make a commitment, a choice. We are to make a choice. And not wavering between God and the world. You know, we cannot have both. Let me ask you a very silly question. Is it possible to have a wife and a girlfriend? Is it possible? Is it possible to have a husband and a boyfriend? Nowadays, yeah, it is possible, but is it, is it right? It's not. But that's exactly what Christians are doing. Not profitable. It's not. Definitely it's not. Jesus, as Jesus said, we cannot serve to God. We cannot serve to God. Either you will serve God or money. Jesus said, either you will serve God or serve idol. Either you will serve God or your boyfriend or girlfriend. Either you will serve God or your career. Either you will serve God or your family. Either you will serve God or your comfort. There is no middle ground. And how can you develop friendship with God? Let's go to verse 9. James says, Be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. That means it carries the idea of being broken and feeling wretched because of your sin. It carries the idea of being broken and feeling wretched because of your sin. And it is exactly 
the feeling expressed by the tax collector who prayed with a contrite spirit. Let's go to Luke chapter 18, verse 13. Luke 18, verse 13. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breath and he sang, God, be merciful to me. Being a tax collector and knowing that he is a sinner. And when he is praying to God, he cannot even lift up his head. He cannot even face heaven. But he's beating his chest and says, God, be merciful to me. I am a sinner. We are to truly treat our sins seriously. But it seems like as long as we put the word casual in front of everything, everything is okay, right? Casual drink, casual date, casual sex, casual gamble. What is the definition of casual? Well, I looked it up in Webster's Dictionary and this is what it says. Happening by chance. The casual means happening by chance. Not planned or expected. Not planned or expected. Or done without much thought, effort, or concern. That's the definition of casual. So what is casual sex? Casual sex are certain types of sexual activity outside of romantic relationship that imply an absence of commitment, emotional attachment, or familiarity between sexual partners. That's the definition that I got from dictionary. <coughs> Casual sex. So hex, sex happened by chance, without much thought. How about casual drink? Get drunk and it happened by chance, without much thought. Is this how Christians should be living? Without much thought. And give a lame excuse. Like, you know, I don't know what happened. You know, oh, I had no choice. And some people say, oh, I knew I shouldn't have done it, but everybody's like that, isn't it? It's not only me. And we just put a casual in front of everything and it's, everything is justified. The Bible has been telling God's people to be characterized as wise, as people who fear God, as people who fight the good fight, as people who resist the devil, as people who put on the whole armor of God and don't take off. But for many Christians today, our Creator, our Savior, our God, our Jesus has become casual Jesus. We believe Jesus casually. That means without much thought. Oh, happen to be Christian. Because I, I was born into a Christian family. You know what? There is no such thing as happen to be a Christian. Even if you're born into a pastor's family or missionary's family, you don't become a, a Christian by chance. A lot of people, they go to church on Sunday casually without much thought. Oh, it's another Sunday, so I got to go. A lot of young people, if I'm too tired from partying too hard last night, we can always miss the church. We go to church so casually without much thought. A lot of colleges say, if I'm exam tomorrow, Oh, I can miss church. God will understand me. We just go to church so casually. Worshiping God when it is convenient. And people say, you don't have to believe God. All oh, committed. You know what? Yes, we should not be legalistic. But we definitely need to discern between discipline and legalism. Just because you do something out of obligation does not mean that you are being legalistic. 
You know, when I tell some like young people to do certain thing, some young people end up telling me, Pastor Dan, don't be so legalistic. And if I tell them to do something, they think that I'm being legalistic. Well, let me give you an example. Let's say you hate someone. And you want to punch that person. But you decided not to. Because you know that that's not the right thing to do. But are you being legalistic? I mean, you want to, but just because you don't do it, doesn't mean that you're being legalistic. Do you know what I'm trying to say here? When I tell them, you know, don't do this and do that, just people automatically think that I'm being legalistic. But that's not true. We as Christian, and you as a Christian, you have to really examine your heart. You gotta be able to discern discipline and being legalistic. We as a Christian, we have to discipline ourselves to become more like Christ. Legalism means obeying the law to earn salvation. Legalism means obeying the law to earn salvation. You know, we don't obey God to be saved. But we are obeying God because we are already saved. And because we have already become God's people, we want to glorify God. We want to live a, a grateful life to our God. That's why we are obeying God. As saved people, we are to mourn for our sins. We must mourn for our sins that we have committed. Even if you have committed only once. And of course, we are to mourn and grieve for the habitual sins that we are committing. Don't take sin lightly. Don't try to justify yourself. Don't compare yourself to other people and say, you know what, everybody is doing it and it is okay. Don't go to church. Don't come to church and don't worship God casually. Don't believe casually. If you are not Christian, yeah, you know what? As a pastor, I have nothing to say. But if you call yourself a Christian, if you have genuinely accepted Jesus as your Savior and Lord, then you are to worship God. You are to believe God with all your heart. Amen? We need to take out the word casual from our Christian walk. <clears throat> Lastly, how can we develop friendship with God? Now, by trusting God's help, with God's grace, we are to humble ourselves. We are to humble ourselves. Let's look at verse 10. Humble yourself before the Lord, and He will exalt you. And as, as I said earlier, the whole process of becoming and being in friend with God starts with humility, and it ends with humility. In chapter 4, verse 5, it says, humble yourself. And verse 10, it says, humble yourself before the Lord, and He will exalt you. So from first, verse uh, 5 to 10, it just starts with humility, and it ends with humility. To be friend with God, we need to humble ourselves before God. You know, it sounds so cheesy, but you know, when I thought about humility being the beginning and the end, I thought of um, uh, uh, humility as like a tortilla of, of taco. You know, you know, when you eat you know, soft taco, it's, it's wrapped with a, a tortilla, right? I mean, like your, your lettuce, your, your tomato, your uh, beef or chicken, whatever, it's, it's, in, it's in tortilla. You know what I'm talking about? You know taco? Yes. So it's just wrapped with, with tortilla, right? And that's humility. Submitting to God. Okay? To submit to God, you need to humble yourself before God. To resist the devil, you need to humble yourself before God. To mourn for your sin, you need to humble yourself before God. So in humility, everything should be in there with a humble heart. Resist the devil by obeying God. Mourn for your sin. Humble yourself. Only the humble people can acknowledge that we are sinful. 
And only the humble people can say, you know what, I cannot save myself. <coughs> only the humble people will depend on God. When we do that, James is telling us that God will exalt us. When we humble ourselves, God will exalt us. Now God exalting us means that He will give us forgiveness and He will give us joy in our walk with Him. And He will lift us up to levels of fellowship and service we never thought possible. And now, um, Golden State Warrior, they won the championship of uh, NBA. And uh, I love Stephen, um, Stephen Curry, such a great basketball player. And I saw LeBron James um, playing fantastic basketball. But let's just say, you know, like Stephen Curry or LeBron James or Michael Jordan and, and Jeremy Lin, you know, they want to play basketball with you. How would you feel? And anytime you want, all you got to do is just call them. Hey, LeBron James. Hey, let's play basketball now. And he's willing to come. Not only that guy, but hey, Michael Jordan, I know you're retired, but come. Anytime you want, you just give them a call and they are willing to come and play basketball with you. I mean, that's impossible. But what if that can really happen? I mean, it's going to be really amazing, right? But that's exactly what God wants to do with us. I mean, can you imagine the creator of this universe? The God who created this universe. The God who made me. He wants to make a time for me anytime I want. Anytime you want to talk to God. Anytime you want to listen to His voice. He wants to speak to you. And He wants to listen to you. He wants to have fellowship with you. Can you imagine that? I mean, when we think about famous people making time for me, we tend to think that, oh, that's impossible. But if they do make times, then we say, wow. But this Creator wants to talk to me. He wants to listen to my voice anytime you want. Anywhere you want. He wants to be there with you. Let's humble ourselves before God. And let's continue to develop, develop friendship with God. Everybody. Now we are saved people. We are God's people. And God wants to be our friend. Can you imagine our Creator being our friend? And that's exactly what He wants to be to us. That we are fellowship with Him. That He, he uh, fulfills our, our um, whatever you want to do. He's our provider. He is our God. Let's not take God lightly. To save us. God sent His only Son, Jesus Christ. And in my death, Jesus died. And through His death, I'm given new and eternal life. And let's really live each moment for God's glory. And let's continue to walk with Him. Not being friend with the world, but truly being friend with God. And walk with God until we face Him face to face. Let's bow our head. Let's take a moment to pray. Friendship with God. Friendship with God. God wants to be friend with us. And we are to submit ourselves before God. We are to humble ourselves before God. 
and we're to mourn for our sins. We are to draw near to God. We're to cleanse our hands and we're to purify our hearts. Let's go one by one. And I want you to really reflect your life on this scripture. Let's come back to God. And let's ask the Holy Spirit to convict us. So that we will get into a deeper relationship with our God.